Hi, in this video I'm going to be talking about Paul and what he says in Romans about weakness of will. Paul, it seems to me, is actually quite a sophisticated philosopher. He's well trained in Greek philosophy and I think he understands the Platonic background and he's here giving his own reaction to the problem of weakness of will. Weakness of will is discussed by Plato in the Republic, is discussed by Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. It's something that took on a special prominence in ethical thinking during the Roman Republic. Um, Ovid, for example, writes about it. It's something that a number of Roman philosophers are concerned with, and Paul here puts it in the central place as well. The question of dealing with temptation, trying to fight your own desires or fight your own reason or fight something else and do the right thing is something that is a critical question. Now, Ovid defines this as knowing the better and doing the worse. It's a question of the gap between knowledge and action. And Plato analyzes it not in terms of a failure of knowledge, as Socrates had, but instead of a matter of reason losing control of the chariot, no longer being able to command and control desire and emotion. Paul thinks those are not the right analyses. And if you look carefully at what he says, you'll realize that in the cases that worry him, we can't use either sort of analysis. It is not an epistemic failure. It's not just a matter of a failure to properly compare short and long-term goods. Nor is it a matter of reason losing control of emotion and desire. In fact, when we look at his cases, we can start thinking, actually, all of these are sort of on the same side. Something else is going on here, something foreign. And that's what worries Paul. It is as if there is something outside me that pulls me away. And consequently, it's going to turn out that the solution to this is outside of me. There is nothing inside me that can be a cure to this problem. So Paul has, I think, an extremely sophisticated analysis and a kind of critique of what is going on in the, the early Socratic dialogues reflecting Socrates' view. And then in the Republic, he thinks there is something else happening and something deeper, in a way, about our very nature. It's something that stems from the depths of human nature itself, and it's not easily solved within those bounds. Well, in Romans, Paul gives us the classic statement of weakness of will. He writes, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. I want to think about what goes on in that passage very carefully. We cannot understand this in Platonic terms. There's something else happening. Look at verse 15 of chapter 7 carefully. What I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. What I want to do. Notice, we've got desire here failing to be enacted. I want to do this thing, but I don't do it. I end up doing the thing I hate. Now we're talking about emotion. To think of it in Platonic terms, we tend to think we're likely to have a victory of desire over reason or of emotion over reason. But that's not what's going on here. The gap is not between reason and action. And then we have to explain that in terms of desire or emotion pushing us to do that action. Instead, here we have a gap between desire and emotion together and action. Well, this is not a case where I want to do this thing and I really would love to do it and I hate doing the opposite, but reason tells me to do what I hate. That's not what's going on here. It's not that there's some rational thing that is driving Paul to this. So in short, reason is either on the sidelines here or together with emotion and desire saying, look, I want to do the right thing. Reason tells me this is the right thing. I want to do the right thing. And emotionally, I am driven toward this. I, I am pulled toward it. I, I, I'm going to be happy with myself if I do this. And I'm going to hate myself if I don't. So I've got all three parts of the soul pulling together and still I don't do it. So Paul says, look, we have a conflict here. It is a conflict between action and actually desire. I don't do what I want to do. Between the action and emotion, I do what I hate to do. And between reason itself, reason is telling me this is the right thing to do, but I don't do it. So there's a gap between the three of those things, between reason and desire, and emotion, and then what I do. How on earth am I to understand that? 
I can't make any sense of that in terms of the Republic. The horses, to look at it this way, are all on the same side. They want to go the way the driver wants them to go. The driver is pulling that way, and still the chariot goes into some other place. Why? How does it happen? The driver is trying to stop the horses from going over the cliff. They don't want to go over the cliff. They're trying to stop it too. And somehow the chariot goes over the cliff anyway. What's going on here? Paul doesn't speak of what leads him astray, what leads that chariot over the cliff, as part of himself at all. Instead, he says, I don't understand what I do. I don't understand what I do. I don't understand why I do it. I don't want to do it. I don't feel good about doing it. Reason doesn't tell me to do it. But I do it. I don't understand it. He says, if I don't want do what I want to do, <laughs> it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So it is sin that drives that chariot off the cliff. And that's not a question of desire. It's not a question of emotion, not a question of reason. Now, sin might well enlist any of those things. So it could be that sin allies itself with desire, with emotion, even with reason itself. And indeed, Paul would think that often happens. But that's not really the key thing. The key thing is not what's going on inside and the relationship among those three parts of the soul, if we have three parts of the soul. What matters is the relation to this thing that feels to me like a foreign thing. It's like something outside of me, pulling me away from what I want to do, what I would feel good about doing, what reason tells me to do. It is like there is something else, something else that pushes me off track, that pushes the chariot right over the cliff, even though no part of it wants to go over that cliff. Here's how Paul puts it. I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Notice he doesn't say in me, with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I think there is this thing, <laughs> this thing that feels foreign. He says, what a wretched man am I! I feel like a stranger to myself. There is something, yes, something in me cooperating with this thing outside. It's not something I can identify with reason. It's not something to be identified with emotion. It's not something to be identified with desire. It is something, however, in me. It is sin working inside me. And so it is as if there is this external force and it's pushing me off the cliff, but there's something inside me that's cooperating. There is something working in me that is leading me to do this. What on earth is going on here? Why can't I understand myself? What a wretched man I am. Well, what is the source of this? It's sin, as if it's coming from outside. It is evil. But is evil in me? Is it outside of me? What is this? Paul does talk about his own sinful nature. There is something in our natures that leads us to cooperate with sin, that leads us to cooperate with this outside force. It's not simply desire. It's not simply emotion or reason. It is something else in us. It is some deep flaw in us that has nothing to do with that platonic triad, has nothing to do with short-term versus long-term goods and deciding whether or not to eat that cake and so on. It is something deeper. It is something more fundamental to the human condition than any of that. So he does this in two ways. He thinks about the distinction between the spirit and the flesh, and it's part of being flesh. That tempts you to think it's a matter of being trapped in the body, and that surely then it must be identified with some physiological reaction, and so have some relation to emotion and or desire, maybe? But that doesn't seem to be the way he really describes it. Yes, it's something in my nature, something presumably in my bodily nature, if in my deepest being, my spiritual being, I really do want to conform to God's law. But on the other hand, it's not simply to be identified with any of those platonic parts. It's something rooted deep, so deep, I can't understand what it is or what it's like or why it's doing it. He does talk about sin also as something outside himself. It's not I who do it, it's the sin that dwells within me. Somehow there is this unknown, inaccessible part of the soul that leads me to cooperate with something 
that operates as if it's an outside force, as if it's something outside pushing me. It is not within me this conflict occurs. It's between me and this thing outside of me that somehow enlists some hidden agent within me. In all of this, it looks like desire is not essential. Desire, in fact, can be cooperating with the good part of me. I want to do the right thing. Emotion can be cooperating. I, I, look, I, I really would be happy to do the right thing, and I, I hate myself for doing the wrong thing. I hate doing it. Reason tells me, do that thing, and then I don't do it. And so the problem isn't that any of those parts are cooperating with that outside thing, or that thing anyway that feels as if it's outside me. There's something else in me that is leading me astray. Well, the point is that there is nothing in Plato, nothing in Socrates, nothing in Plato's mature theory in the Republic that can help us understand this kind of problem. You think, but I, I don't understand. What's an example of this? I mean, what is Paul talking about? Well, presumably there are such cases. You know that this is something you shouldn't do. You feel guilty and kind of hate yourself for doing it as you do it. You really don't want to be doing it, but you do it anyway. Maybe you're a drug addict who sits there and thinks, I know I shouldn't do this. I know this is terrible. I'm trying to resist it. You really don't want to take that drug. Your emotion is drawn away from it. You think, no, I, I hate the thought. I'm going to hate myself for doing this, but you do it. Maybe you're an alcoholic trying to resist that next drink. And reason is telling you, resist it. Desire is saying, I don't want to take that drink. I really don't want to take that drink. You're going to hate yourself for drinking it. But in the end, you do it. In these cases, there's something like a very powerful physical impulse to do it. And it's not really a question of desire exactly. It's not a question of emotion. It's not reason. It's something else within you. Something else. There is a reason why Alcoholics Anonymous and various other 12-step programs have a pattern that, as we'll see later, is basically the pattern of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. That's really where the 12 steps come from. And it's because there is a certain kind of failing that we have that can't be analyzed in Platonic terms, can't be analyzed in terms of, you know, find out more, or get control of desire, get control of emotion. No, it's a matter of something else something deeper, something harder to understand in human nature. And it's a harder fight to win. So I think Paul has in mind something like that. Now, Paul himself is not an alcoholic. He's not a drug addict. But that's the closest thing I think we can point to, to how he understands the power of sin. It's like that for us. It's something that is impelling us to do these things we don't really want to do, that we hate ourselves for doing, that we know we shouldn't do. But we do them anyway because of something that is like a deep physiological impulse. We do them in a way that does feel foreign to ourselves. It's like there's a demon pushing you to do it. It's hidden somewhere deep inside the flesh. It's not something we can easily analyze. We can't really say, ah, oh, there's a psychological faculty we can analyze, isolate, describe that is responsible for this. It is something else. It feels like there is a hidden betrayal going on inside me, this element of something inside me that is cooperating with this hostile external force, making me do things I know I shouldn't do, I don't want to do, I hate myself for doing. Sin is like that, Paul says. And that's something that we can't understand in Socratic or Platonic terms. It's something that requires a deeper understanding. Moreover, that suggests that we within ourselves cannot solve this problem. How do we get stronger? How do we fight it? It's not a question of knowing more or strengthening reason, putting reason in command. It's not going to help. It's like some force outside of us. He says the only thing that can defeat it, that can help us to become stronger against it, is the help of something outside of us. We do not have the power to fight this under our own resources, we need external help. We need an ally. Hence, only the Spirit, only something spiritual, only with the help of God can we overcome what is really 
at the foundation of weakness of will.